Hello everyone and welcome back to The Power of Reason. This is the fourth episode of this series, so if you missed the previous ones, I recommend watching them before this. In the previous episode, we have seen how thinking by availability can lead us to a biased view of the world through the lens of the media and how our emotions affect our judgment of technology. Today, I am going to say something that might come as a surprise to many. We are all overconfident in our knowledge. Yes, we are constantly told that confidence is a positive attribute, the key to success, the key to happiness and so forth. But let me tell you this, when it comes to our opinions, we could do with a little less confidence and a bit more critical thinking and rationality. The real confidence is the confidence to debate openly and to realize that our opinions or political views are not defining of our identity. What we know is the product of what we have been exposed to. So we should be confident enough to let go of ideas we held previously if a better theory is available. So confidence in this respect is good. Overconfidence in our knowledge is not good. So there is no shame in letting go of ideas that we held previously. Uh, we only have to gain with this attitude because if the ultimate goal is getting closer to the truth, that's precisely what we are doing. And there is something else that I said many, many times before, but I will say it again because, well, repetition is the best way to learn. So let me go again. We live in a world with very complex technology, complex economy, policies, and vast data sets. So we must uh, form an opinion um, on a broad variety of very difficult topics. Unfortunately, these opinions are for the most part formed by our intuitive thinking, and then they're accepted by our rational self without further analysis. This is because our intuitive thinking is so quick at providing an answer, while on the other hand, engaging our rational thinking requires a lot of effort. Before I go into explaining overconfidence, let me elaborate a bit more on the concept of answering an easier question. So when we are asked about something, particularly if you ask about something complex, our intuitive thinking tries to answer quickly based on the knowledge that we have in memory and also based on how easily this memory can be retrieved. Now, if an answer to the question does not come in to mind immediately, we subconsciously answer a simpler question without even realizing that we are answering a different question. Mm. For example, consider the question, how popular will the president be in three months? This is a very complex question in a very unpredictable environment, right? Um, this could be any president of any country, right? So we have the illusion of an answer because subconsciously we answer a different question. We answer the question, how popular is the president now? And this is what we subconsciously answer instead without even realizing. So we have seen this before, in fact, in previous experiments last time in the previous episode, we've seen that the question, how much would you pay to save birds that are drowning in oil pools? People subconsciously answered this question by answering a different question, which is how do I feel about a drowning bird? And then they match the emotional intensity of this response to the amount of money that they were willing to pay, neglecting all other information, which in this case was the number representing the actual number of birds saved. So when we are asked a question like, how happy are you with your life? This is a very complex assessment. So we replace this complex assessment by answering a simpler question, which is, how do I feel right now? 
The answer comes so easily to mind that we just accept it as true. So similarly, in previous examples, we have seen that people substitute the question, what do you think about this particular technology? With another question, which is, how do I feel about this technology? So there is a difference between how you, what do you think about something, what do you feel about something, and the two things get often conflated without us even realizing. So even when we are missing information, our intuitive thinking will provide an answer. It likes to give us an answer. Our mind likes a Korean story. It likes to jump to conclusions. So when we are asked, will this political candidate have a successful career? Well, we can answer this by answering a different question, which is, does this political candidate look like a winner. So how the candidate looks will actually affect our opinion without us even realizing. So once again, I'm not saying that we are irrational. We are all perfectly capable of rational thinking, but this takes effort. It takes effort. And so when we think in a rush, which is most of the times, then, well, this is what happens. And now let's move on onto the mechanisms which make us overconfident. So when we express a judgment or when we form an opinion, we use the information that we have available. It seems almost useless to say, but we cannot think what we do not know. We do not know what we do not know. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that is literally what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> So a uh, rational explanation of anything needs a complete and reliable um, piece of information, right? So the problem is that our intuitive thinking does not need all the information to create a story, as long as the story is coherent, right? So a coherent story is immediately a subconsciously accepted as true. And the more easily the story is formed, the more confident we are with this story. So our intuitive system automatically ignores not only the fact that we might be missing parts of the story, but also the fact that some of the information might be inaccurate because we like to complete the story. The most, component, the, the most common example of this is when we form an opinion about someone we just met. We are missing a big part of the picture because we just met this person and yet we cannot help forming an opinion about them. Our mind does that for us. So paradoxically, the less information we have, the easier it is to form a coherent story because, well, because there are fewer pieces to the puzzle. This means that we, the less we know, the more confident we are in our knowledge. Right? So believing the coherent story that is created by our intuitive thinking, despite the missing information, is automatic and irresistible. And it feels good. Uh, the fact that it feels good, you know, believing a coherent story feels good, is often exploited by conspiracy theorists or by sensationalist documentary makers who present only incomplete or in unreliable information, leaving the viewer or the reader to jump to a conclusion which seems irresistible to believe. Think about documentaries such as Tiger King or The Game Changers, you know, very popular documentaries on Netflix, classic sensationalist documentaries. Um, in a famous, very famous series of experiments, some legal cases were presented to different groups of people, right? So one group was presented only the version of the plaintiff, one group was presented only the version of the defendant, and one group heard both versions, just like a jury would. So everybody knew the setup of the experiment, and yet, People who heard only one version of the story were more confident in their opinion. 
for example, the opinion that either the plaintiff or the defendant were right. People who heard both versions were not as confident because reaching a definitive conclusion becomes harder when you hear both sides. If you have recently watched Tiger King, to go back to that on Netflix, um, you have surely noticed that the way the evidence is presented about Carol Baskin murdering her husband, it is almost irresistible to believe that she did it. The feeling of confidence, it's really good. Of course she did it, right? That's how you feel. However, the truth is that the detectives who actually investigated the case, and that's their job, did not find sufficient evidence to even arrest her, let alone convict her. And so they analyzed way more information than the average Netflix viewer, who was only presented incomplete information framed in a certain way. So, of course, Carol is an easily dislikable character in the series. And... She cannot prove her innocence, so our intuitive thinking quickly jumps to a conclusion. So a uh, very interesting experiment would be for you to go on her website after watching the series and uh, read what she has to say about it, right? So hearing her version will actually make you feel far less confident about your conclusion. And you will also experience another cognitive bias. Uh, or cognitive biases as you read her defense. So you already dislike her, we established that, and you will then fall prey of the effect bias. You will be very quick at dismissing the evidence that she presents, uh, and you will fall prey of the confirmation bias. So you only look for information that confirms your theory. Also, there is a feeling of unease as you read her evidence, because the coherent story that you had in your head slowly becomes less coherent. And many people will reject it altogether and stick to their initial judgment. And this is how critical thinking becomes a tiring exercise. And that's why we rather avoid it most often than not. Another feature of overconfidence is that people who just acquired some information about a subject suddenly feel happy with a simple story that is coherent in their mind. So these people will be more confident than experts because the experts actually know that the story is way more complex than what it seems. And the more skilled one becomes at something, the more they can recognize the limitations of their ability in that particular field. And this was presented in a very famous paper by Kruger and Dunning, who showed that ex experimentally showed that people who scored the lowest in skills, such as grammar and logical thinking, rated themselves way above average. And this is because the very skill that they were lacking was essential in order to, uh, to judge the quality of their ability. And um, in fact, I, I, have, um, I have their paper here. And I have a very good quote. So, people who are unskilled in these domains suffer a dual burden. Not only do these people reach erroneous conclusions and make unfortunate choices, but their incompetence robs them, robs them of the metacognitive ability to realize it. So, not only the incompetence obviously leads them to make a mistake, but also it means that they don't have the skills to recognize this mistake. I really like this quote. This is uh, the paper from Kruger and Dunning from 1999. Um, this very same effect, in fact, was famously summed up by Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin himself. So way before cognitive psychology was even a thing, uh, way before Kruger and Dunning or Daniel Kahneman. Um, and I remember a quote from Darwin from, I think, 1871. And it went something like that. Ignorance more frequently begets confidence 
then that's knowledge. So once again, overconfidence comes from ignorance. Another very good quote is by Daniel Kahneman, of course, who is one of the founders of modern cognitive psychology. And uh, I have his quote here. Our comforting conviction that the world makes sense rests on a secure foundation. Our almost unlimited ability to ignore our ignorance. I really like this quote for its effect, but Kahneman tends to have a slightly pessimistic notion of our rationality, which I don't necessarily share. I am actually a believer not only in reason, but also in our rationality, because that is in fact the baseline from which we can measure irrationality, right? We are capable of rationality, that's why we can recognize irrationality. And we gauge intuition for what it is. One thing to take away from all of this is that it is generally wiser to avoid the urge to jump to conclusions and to resist the temptation of immediately reacting to new information. We should normally leave some time for more information to surface and then deploy attention and rational thinking before expressing judgment or expressing an opinion. This is generally true in the midst of some breaking news, for example. Reporters tend to focus on the incomplete information currently available and on purpose they will jump to a conclusion because that's what sells. It, it is usually only very long after the occurrence that proper data and evidence are gathered and then an expert analysis becomes available. <laughs> This is generally a better time, you know, later on is a better time to form a more accurate and a more complete opinion of the facts. So we should be a bit, a bit less reactive. In doing so, however, if we want to learn something, it is also important to remember that in the, we made inaccurate predictions in the past. So let's remember these inaccurate predictions that we made earlier and check how different they were from what actually ended up happening. This is a surprisingly difficult task because once our beliefs have changed, um, our mind actually struggles to reconstruct past states of knowledge. And then we will see, um, probably next time, how this affects our thinking. And this is particularly important when we talk about hindsight bias. So, Let's just leave it on this note for now. Uh, I think it's time to wrap it up. And in fact, I think it's time to go to sleep for me. So, see you again very soon. Bye now.